Hey folks, it's Nate. Thanks for joining me at the art table again today. Well, if you're here for the clickbait, I appreciate it. For a while now, channels I follow have been talking about the contrast between the treatment of Hades and Stellar Blade. And I thought it was very interesting, especially in light of the things I said recently about Zack Snyder. If you haven't watched that video, the bird's eye view is that Zack seemed to view the reception of Rebel Moon as a conflict between himself and focused groups. Or at the very least, he viewed Rebel Moon as a battle between his personal vision and movies that have a little bit more studio interference. I'm of the opinion that Zack, as a very creative person used to crafting stories, kind of fell into story crafter mode and simply set himself up as one half of a narrative in conflict with these focused group movies on the other side of the equation. And yes, I do think that's largely what has happened in the case of Hades 2. Someone noticed that the same people that were criticizing Stellar Blade were big fans of Hades 2. In fact, the very element from Stellar Blade that they were criticizing, sexy character designs, they were praising in Hades 2. And don't get me wrong, some really crazy mental gymnastics were exerted in justifying this preference. My point is not to rehash them here or make a 15 minute disposition on why I think they're pretty much full of crap. Yeah, Stellar Blade has pretty sexy character designs. Hades 2, also very sexy character designs. There's a lot of eye candy in both of these games, even though their art styles are significantly different from each other. Is this purely a tribal distinction? Yeah, I think it is. Supergiant games have been around for a very long time. Their first game, Bastion, was released 13 years ago. Development began in 2009, meaning that with the founding of Supergiant Studio. They've released a number of games, most of which have been good, and the first entry into the Hades series was a critical darling when it was released. Supergiant games have always had a very strong narrative core to them. They get really great voice actors to narrate really great stories that players explore and unlock through their actions rather than sitting through cutscenes, with the possible exception of Pyre, which I've never played. That's not to say their games don't have some things that look kind of like cutscenes, they do, but they're generally very short and serve to just introduce characters or situations to us. Most of what we get, we choose to interact with as we go through the game. It's a very clever and very powerful game design that lets the player really get engaged with the story they're telling. I don't know a whole lot about the story of Stellar Blade. I've really only seen a couple of cinematics. It looks quite good. I don't know that it's terribly deep, but the character animation is certainly expressive and the voice acting is high quality. Although I don't think it's quite as good as what I'm used to from Supergiant. But then again, I haven't actually listened to as much of it as I have of their games. So it's harder for me to make a judgment on this front. And since I'm not about to shell out the money for a PlayStation, I think I'm just going to have to wait to experience the game in a different venue. However, the big issue here is not so much the storytelling as the studio. Again, I said this was tribal. Shift Up Studios is a Korean publisher that appears to primarily focus in mobile gaming. They don't have a history of these kind of big sprawling open world video games. Most people who write about or live stream video games tend not to interact with mobile content a whole lot, so they're not likely to be familiar with the studio's work to begin with. On top of that, this is a Korean studio and most of the journalists that I have access to are American or English. And due to the language barrier, they don't have a whole lot of access to this studio to begin with, whereas Supergiant Games has been quite accessible at conventions and podcasts. They're a known entity. And so, the game's journalist ecosphere is just more prepared to interact with Supergiant Studios and they give them, I think, a little more grace. And I think that's ultimately why we saw a difference in the reaction to these two games. It's as simple as having a different reaction to one of your friends and a total stranger. However, the pushback to this originates because the journalists are friendly with Supergiant Games. If you've been using the internet for more than a couple of years, or even a couple of weeks, and you're interested in video games, you know that the journalists who cover video games and the people who play them rarely see eye to eye. 
both the journalists and the gamers have that oppositional mindset that Zack Snyder does, and so they very quickly tend to fall into this battle over the meaning of games and their elements. And you know what? It's hard to blame them. However, in this case, I feel that Supergiant Studios is somewhat caught in the crossfire. Very unfairly so. Both gamers and games journalists have very big narratives to push. Journalists want to emphasize their connections in the industry and their ability to access more information than their readers. That's what makes a journalist valuable, after all. They're going out and they're getting a story. Or they're cultivating those kind of long-term connections that let them get information before anyone else. In the age of the internet, where information moves very rapidly, that kind of reputation is very hard to get and hold on to, because anyone can learn just about anything they want with a couple of Google searches, at least until the AI takes over and generates your search results from the ether, but that's neither here nor there. Gamers, on the other hand, want to experience something that looks really nice and plays really well. Honestly, I don't think it's any more complicated than that. It's often overblown with talks about power fantasy or things like that, but I think all of that really overcomplicates the matter. At the fundamentals, gamers are pushing looks good, plays well. And it's really hard to make something that looks good and plays well, so gamers tend to be pretty wary about the games that come out, with good reason. Now, with these two fundamental narratives underpinning journalists and gamers, it doesn't look like the two groups would automatically be in conflict. Journalists should be able to help gamers find games that look good and play well, right? Sure, some of them even did. Total Biscuit remains a legend to this day, even though he passed away some seven or eight years ago, because he was very good at doing exactly that. However, the late great John Bain left us before the culture war hit its peak, and the culture war kind of twisted that natural relationship. And by kind of, I mean ruined it. These days, most journalism is done by extremely wealthy people with high-priced degrees. Unless, of course, you're covering niche hobbies like gaming, in which case it's done by very poor people with high-priced degrees. Either way, that degree stamps your brain into a very specific mold. And that mold falls on one very specific side of the culture war. A very aggressive side of the culture war. That side came out swinging about a decade ago, and they really haven't stopped. And while some people will knuckle under when someone comes swinging their fists at them, a lot of people will just hit back, which is why the culture war rages to this very day. Unfortunately, over the course of the culture war, the tactics of one side always become the tactics of both sides. While the journalists that were the aggressors in the gamer culture war tended to push people into camps in the early days, now we're seeing it happen everywhere. And unfortunately, Hades 2 has been pushed into the journalist side of the culture war camps, and I think that's a cry in shame. I don't think Supergiant wanted to be there. Clearly, they share some ideas with the DEI cult that rules much of corporate America today. I don't really think the Greek pantheon needs an Asian in it. And I say that as someone who is a China man myself. I don't think the Greek pantheon really needed a wheelchair in it, but I have to admit, if you're going to include one, Hephaestus is probably the right guy to give it to. Although personally, I would have just given him the clockwork leg and called it a day because that thing's dope. But unfortunately, what I think has been missed in all of this is the heart of the Hades story. And from what I've heard, a lot of the people who have been carrying water for the supergiant woke disaster piece narrative, they haven't even played the game, so they don't know the story. They don't understand that the story of Hades is probably the most subversive story that has been told in gaming in years. What do I mean by that? Yes, it has all the trappings of the prevailing culture. Mal representation. Girls who are the key to everything. The message. But those are all generalities. They're tropes. They're costumes. Stories are not general. They're not tropey. They're not costumes. Stories are specific. They're about specific people doing specific things for specific reasons. If your story has no particulars, it's not really a story. And the thing about the story of Hades, it's about the foolishness of ignoring the people 
you find disgusting. It's about finding the good in people who are just nasty. It's about the importance of not throwing away your family just because maybe you kind of hate them. If you're not familiar with the story of Hades, it revolves around Zagreus, the firstborn son of the god of the underworld. When Hades and his brothers Zeus and Poseidon divided up the cosmos, he was given the underworld. And it seems that his family up high on Mount Olympus shunned him for it. The underworld was out of sight and kind of gross, and he got all the dead people who couldn't worship the deities anymore, and so did not flatter their egos. The gods of Olympus ignored him, and he was very lonely. So he persuaded Persephone to marry him. However, when Zagreus was young, Persephone ran away from Hades. She hid herself, not really wanting to go back to Olympus, because all the gods there were egotistical basket cases, but unable to endure living under the ground any longer. After all, she was a god of green and growing things. So Zagreus grew up not knowing his mother, with a very grim and unpleasant father, who never seems to have gotten over the way his wife abandoned him. Furthermore, by the decree of the fates, Zagreus cannot leave the underworld for any length of time. He can't go to the surface, even if he wanted to. And believe me, he does want to. From that beginning point, Zagreus sets out to prove his mettle to his father, find his mother, reunite his parents, and bring some measure of peace to his bickering family. The gods of Olympus are terrible people. But by showing grace and patience, Zagreus brings his family back together again. Now, I don't know the full story for Hades too, but I know that Kronos, the titan of time, and the father of the gods of Olympus, has come back and overthrown the house of Hades. Melanoe, the daughter of Hades, now faces the challenge of killing time. But is she really going to kill Kronos? He's immortal, just like the gods. Maybe what she actually needs to do is follow in her brother's footsteps and heal another rift in the family, even though Kronos is a bigger ego and a nastier person than her father or Zeus or any of the gods of Olympus were. You see, wrapped up in all that quote-unquote woke packaging, the stories in Hades actually carry the Achilles heel for the religion of envy that drive so many people in the culture war. They're stories of the hard work and patience necessary to achieve forgiveness and reconciliation. It's a shame that's been lost in all this talk about a completely unrelated game. But hopefully, if you've watched this video to the end, for you at least, it won't be. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. There's a like button and a subscribe button down there. You can use those as you see fit, and I'll talk to you later.